If you'll turn to Esther chapter 5, that's where we'll be at today, starting in the very first verse. As I was looking at the video, it made me think of camp. First of all, the reason why it made me think of camp was every time that I got up to preach, that was a song that we sang uh, right before that time. And uh, that's what I told Terry whenever uh, I was in the back. I said, it makes me think back at, to camp because that was a song that we sang before I got up to preach. But as I saw the video, I saw the water, and I did something this year, which probably will not surprise many of you, uh, but uh, I did something this year that uh, took me back some years ago. We went to the Winchester swimming pool, Winchester where I grew up, and uh, we, they had a high dive there. Whenever I was a kid, we didn't call it abuse, but mom kind of kicked us out of the house in the afternoon and the place that we went because it was only about a half a mile away from the house was a swimming pool and so I swim like a fish I, I, I can swim really easily uh, and I remember that uh, they had a low dive and they had a high dive and uh, all the time in, in the summertime I would dive off of the high dive or I'd dive off the low dive but the difference this time was that uh, Whenever I was a kid, I didn't weigh 265 pounds, and I was also quite young and not 56 years old. And I dove off the dive, uh, low dive first, and it was like I landed into concrete as I dove off, and I thought to myself, well, why did it hurt now that it didn't hurt before? And then I realized there was a simple reason for that. I had hair back then. And so now that I don't have hair, it kind of hurts a little bit to land into the water. But second of all, I, I, people were surprised because I started climbing the high dive. And they're like, you're going on the high dive? I was like, yeah, I'm going off the high dive. I did it as a kid all the time. Um, but uh, as I saw that, saw that water, it reminded me of stepping out off of that high dive. You know, once you're in the air, I don't know if you know this or not, but once you're in the air, you're kind of committed, aren't you? I mean, you can't go back to the diving board. You are committed. Now, it only takes a few seconds until you land into the water, but you're committed. And it reminded me of uh, that water there reminded me of our commitment to the Lord. Once we step out uh, on faith, there's no going back. We continue to follow God in our step uh, of faith. And Believe it or not, this has nothing to do with my sermon, so I don't know. But there are times when we look back and we think that we want to go back to the diving board. But yet we're committed because there's no going back. This week I did a steady, steady, steady soul search. And I said, why am I stuck? Why, why am I in the position that I am and why do I really not feel peace even though I'm playing all these games and putting on this mask why do I not feel peace I went to the cemetery uh, last Wednesday and uh, first time that I had seen Linda's tombstone physically and that's where I really realized that I'm committed because what went through my head is this is the end of this chapter that I must step forward. That even though she doesn't walk with me anymore, I'm not dead. And if I'm committed to God, I need to be committed to God. And so I started praying. And I said, God, you need to show me what the struggle is. You need to show me, and I'm hoping as I tell the story that someone is relating you need to tell me what the problem is. God being God, he, he was willing to do that. And, and I hate to confess it to you, but I need to. I, for nine months, I've been mad at God. And I gave him all the reasons of why I was committed to him. I gave up everything. And then you took my wife and... And now I've got this. But it's not bad to admit that you're mad at God. 
what the sin is to stay mad at God. And so as I confessed it, I began to say, God, this week, starting on Monday, I went to a counselor. I went to celebrate recovery. And they're all saying that what I need to do is rely on God and stop trying to hang on to people and past and, and all of those things. And so for the first time, I, I've started a new journey. I'm not going to be perfect all the time. But the new journey is this. God, I trust you. I lay down all that I have, all that I had, and I trust you. So as you walk by my office, and probably for a long time, you'll see a sign there on the board. And it's frog. Fully rely on God. That way, as I walk in the office, I will remind myself that today, I am fully relying on God. But my question, as I lead into the sermon now, <laughs> who is God? Uh, I know the answer is Jesus. I mean, that's a good Sunday school answer. Let, anybody that's in Sunday school, if, if the Sunday school teacher asks you a question, the answer is always Jesus. And then you've, you've got it. But who is Jesus? Is Jesus not the king we speak of him as the king of kings and the lord of lords and what does it mean to actually enter into the throne room of god i often think of the throne room as the wizard of anybody ever seen the wizard of oz raise your hand if you've ever seen the wizard of oz i mean seen it all the way through i remember whenever i was a kid they had it on like the wonderful world of disney that used to be a thing wonderful world of Disney but the problem was that we had church on Sunday night and so about the time that they almost get to the throne room mom and dad say okay shut it off we're going to church now I never knew for until I was an adult how that movie ended but the thing that I really liked was the throne room they was going into you remember that hallway they was going into and they was talking about what they were going to meet whenever they meet in to the throne room and then they have the throne room and it's big powerful Oz and, and, and I have a, a, a feeling of, of awe and wonder of what God's throne room looks like or will feel like well Charles H. Spurgeon said this about the throne room of God there's no attribute more comforting to his children than that of God's sovereignty under the most adverse circumstances and the most severe trials, they believe that sovereignty has ordained their afflictions, that sovereignty overrules them, and that sovereignty will sanctify them all. There is nothing for which the children ought to be more earnestly contend to than the doctrine of their master over all creation, the kingship of God over all the works of his own hands, the throne of God and his right to sit upon that throne for it is God upon the throne whom we trust if you have found Esther chapter 5 starting with verse 1 would you stand with the reading of God's word please now it happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robe and stood in the inner court of the king's palace across from the king's house while well, the king sat on his royal throne in the royal house facing the entrance of the house so it was when the king uh, saw Queen Esther standing in the court that she found favor in his sight and the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand then Esther went near uh, went near and touched the tip of the scepter and the king said to him, What do you wish, uh, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you up to half the kingdom. So Esther answered, If it pleases the king, let the king and Haman come uh, today to the banquet that I have prepared for him. Then the king said, Bring Haman quickly. 
that he may do as Esther has said. So the king and Haman went to the uh, banquet that Esther had prepared. As a banquet of wine, at the banquet of wine, the king said to Esther, "What is your petition? It shall be granted you. Whatever you re- what is your request, up to half the kingdom, it shall be done." Then Esther answered and said, "My petition and request is this: If I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my peti- petition and fulfill my request." Then let the king and Haman come to a banquet, which I will prepare for them. And tomorrow I will do as the king has said. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you that we can come and we can worship you, we can praise you. Lord, I pray that we get a glimpse of what the throne room is like. And that you are indeed the king of kings and lord of lords. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Do you know the king? Queen Esther dressed in her royal robes. She didn't dress in her shorts and t-shirt and say, Yo, king, how you doing? She had respect for the king. We also see that she also waited. She waited to get the king's attention. She knew the power of the king. If she was to simply show up, she could, it would cost her her life. But she w- went the way that it was supposed to go. And, and uh, that goes contrary to what the, our Western culture says. But she didn't just show up. She, she put on her royal robes, her, her best, her, her finest. And she waited to get the king's attention. Because she knew the power of the king. And he simply could have said, put her to death. And immediately she would have been put to death. So she went away the way that the culture would say. And like I said, it, it goes contrary to what our Western culture says, what Western feminism says. This treatment flares in the nostrils of Western culture where we think that we can just show up and, and do whatever we want or say whatever we want and, and, and someone ought to take it. If Queen Esther was going to do that, she would have been dead And I also present to you that if we would do that, we would have been dead too. But she went and did what the custom would say. Our Western culture is not biblically based. Who hasn't heard Ephesians 5, 22 to 23? Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife. As also Christ is head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Growing up, I heard that a lot. Wives, submit to your husbands. No matter what he does, no matter how he treats you, submit to your husbands, which is not what this is saying. Matter of fact, if you want to be truthful elsewhere in the Bible, it also says submit yourselves to one another. But people like to use that against women. And... uh, uh, it, it really got under my skin when I was at Hamlet Grange College. I saw how the people who were studying the Bible was treating the, the girls that was in their lives and made them carry the textbooks and open the door for them. And, and they would use this verse, wives, submit to your husbands. What does your husband need or what does your husband want? I, when they turn 12 or 13, you have all sorts of magazines that says, this is what your husband really wants. This is what your husband really wants. And people will buy that and, and take it home and study it. Uh, and, and if you're doing that, I want to make it really easy for you. Guys are not that complicated. You don't need to buy magazines to really know what guys want. What it speaks of here... In Ephesians 5, 22 to 23, is what guys want is respect. They want respect. And it's interesting because Otis Redding was the one who wrote the Aretha Franklin song, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. So it was a guy that wrote that song because what guys are looking for is respect. He wants to be treated as though he has a purpose in the family, which includes more than a paycheck, going to work and collecting a paycheck. 
He wants to know that he is making a difference in the lives of his family. He wants a, a purpose. He wants to ask the question, do I matter to you? Do I matter to this family? And so what guys need, that way you don't have to buy any more magazines, what guys want and need is respect. Ephesians 5, 25 to 33 goes on further and says that what we need to do is we need to love our wives. We need to love our wives. As a matter of fact, there are some things that as I began to look at it this week, I thought was quite interesting. Women are created differently. Amen? Women are created differently. Guys are uh, uh, created to want respect, but what women want is love. And it seems strange here that I'm speaking of women when I'm not one. But what they want is love. Not the marriage love. Not the wedding day love. It reminds me of an older couple, and the woman looks at her husband after 50 years and say, why don't you love me? anymore he said i do she said but you don't tell me you love me and the man says i did and the woman said when did you tell me that i love you that, that you love me he said if you remember 50 years ago in the wedding during the vows i said i love you if anything changes i'll let you know the woman wants to know that the husband loves her every day. I know that Linda was very much that way every once in a while. When things began to feel like I was taking her for granted, she would ask me, do you love me? Yeah, of course I love you. But it's nice to know. Have you noticed we've done a really good job of beating the wives and the women up by saying, submit to your husband, submit to your husband, submit to your husband, submit to your husband. So much that I did a wedding vow that the wife, the new uh, wife, said thank you for speaking on Ephesians chapter 5 and not just wives submit your hu to your husband. However, Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, speaks twice as much to men, husbands, as he does to the women. He simply tells the women to submit to your husband. But he's got a paragraph for us men, the husbands. However, it's rarely taught. And it says this, which when I heard it, it really got to me. As Christ loves the church. As Christ loves the church. So the question every day that we need to ask ourselves, men, husbands, is do I love my wife that much that I would go to the cross for her, that I would pay my life for her? Or do we simply, after a period of years, take each other for granted? And no longer show that type of love. There are some who may ask, what happened to the come as you are? We say that all the time. Jesus will accept you just exactly how you are. Come as you are. Come accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior as you are. Which is true... However, remember, Queen Esther is already in the royal family. You see, she's different than someone who was coming for the first time. Whenever I was growing up, my parents treated me differently than they would a guest. And as I got older, I would treat troubled teens differently if they were living in my house as I would if they would come as a guest. I've had several troubled teens that were staying in my house, and oddly enough, they didn't stay very long. Because I decided that I was going to treat them differently if they were living or if they needed responsibility. One particular one I remember, 
which is amazing because she says I'm the greatest pastor that ever lived in her life. But she came. Her mom said, I have had enough. I can't stand her anymore. Would you please take her? And I said, sure, I'll, I'll take her. And I began to set down some ground rules. First of all, dishes get dirty. You need to do the dishes. Second of all, I will expect you to have your room picked up. I will have you, expect you to have your bed made. And I will expect that you clean yourself hygienically. Well, it was interesting. It took her a week to realize she didn't want to live that way. So she called her dad and she came back home. I treated her differently than someone who was just going to spend the night. Why? Because in the royal family here, and in the family, whenever uh, I was older, in helping troubled teens, their family. It is true, Jesus will accept you exactly how you are, no matter how you are. But when he saves you, he expects you to improve. He refuses to leave you the way that you are. You are walking a new journey. You are in the equivalent of me being in the air after jumping off the high dive. You are now committed. The sad thing, and it has been going on for years and years and years because Paul speaks about it. Paul spoke about sin and how the Jesus forgives us of our sin. And so the, the, the Roman people, the Christians said, well, if that's the case, then I need to sin more. And God said, or, or Paul said, God forbid. Yes, it's grace, but he expects you to be better than what you were. I have a friend, and she's a girl. Don't get too excited. She's not a girlfriend. She's a friend who has helped me along my journey over the last couple of months. I told her my blood sugars over the last couple of weeks and she said this. She's a night nurse. She said, one of my pet peeves is people who do not take care of themselves. Well, that puts me in a boat. And I said, okay, well, I will promise you this and this and this and this. Which basically is what I was supposed to be doing in the first place. And she said this. She said... I expect you to do better, but I don't expect you to be perfect. God expects us to be better, but he knows that we will not be perfect. And when we sin, what he expects us to do, he expects us to go to him and to repent. You see, that's the reason why David had the heart of God. If you look at the, the, the story of David there's all sorts of things that we as human beings can look at and say, how in the world could David possibly have the heart of God in what he did? After all, he killed somebody so he could have Bathsheba. How in the world could he do this? I'm going to fill the gap in a little bit for you. Because when he realized it was sin, he confessed his sin and repented of it. What we like to do many times is to realize that maybe we have sin in our life, but we want to hang on to it. And we don't want to give it to God. We don't want to repent over it. Whenever I first came to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, the question was this, are you ready to get rid of all your sins? And my answer was, because I believe in honesty, no, there are some sins that I enjoy, that I want to hang on to. And I wasn't ready to follow God. However, whenever it came to the point in time where I was at the bare bones, I said, God, I'm willing to give up everything for you and to follow you. God expects us to do better even though we will never, until we reach heaven, be perfect. But what has happened many times is this. We have grown tired and we have given up on our Christian faith and following God because we thought the journey was too difficult. And the reason why the journey was too difficult was because we stopped walking with God. 
And so we need to pick back up where we were. Entering the throne room, Queen Esther was sitting across the house where the king stayed. They did not stay in the same place. She had her quarters and he had his quarters, or she had her house and he had his house. So she's sitting across where the king could see her, but still they had different places that they lived. And she must get the king's attention then maybe, just maybe, not that he has to, but just maybe, he will extend an invitation to her. Bill Ingvall, I, I enjoy listening to his comedy, although he's not Christian, but I enjoy listening to his comedy. He spoke about a wife, specifically his wife. And he said this, if he walks into the kitchen during breakfast and she's silent, he says, honey, what's wrong? And he said, if she doesn't answer for five minutes, he says, honey, is it me? And he says, if she doesn't answer in 30 minutes, it's me. And so immediately he looks at her and he says, I don't know what I did or what I didn't do, but I'd like to go to my room and think about it for a while. We need to get God's attention. We need an invitation to enter into the throne room. How do we do that? First Peter 1.15 says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. you know how you get God's attention, how you get King Jesus' attention? By being holy, sanctified, set apart for God's service. Why? Because there's so few who are doing it that he looks and says, there's somebody out there who is trying to be the best that they can. They're trying to be set apart for God's service, and it gets their attention. So in what manner should we be holy? First of all, we need to be holy in our character, in who we are. We need to be holy in our attitude. We accept bad attitudes, and attitudes stink. We need to be holy in our praise. Now, we can put on a mask, and we can look really good to the outside, and people say, well, that person's a saint. That person is truly serving Jesus and be totally against God. The problem is that Jesus pulls away the mask and he knows the truth. I can come on Sunday morning, I can raise my hand, I can praise the Lord, I can say amen, and be far away from God. And what Jesus is saying is your attitude, your character, your praise stinks because I know the truth. There are many people who are putting on masks. I grew up in a church, in a family, and my dad was a pastor, where we were told every time that we left the door that we must put on some sort of a performance. We must look good. We must act good. Because if we don't, we will shame the family. Life is not a performance. Life is being real in front of Almighty God. And when we are, Revelation 3.20 says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Become real in the presence of Jesus is where true Holy Spirit power lies. Queen Esther must ask the impossible task. She must ask to have a banquet with the king. Now that to us seems very simple. Hey honey, why don't we go have a picnic? But it was more than that in the time of Persia. A couple of things you need to know about this particular banquet. The king and queen did not eat supper or lunch 
together very often. It was a rare time when they would get together and they would eat. Second of all, they never invited anyone else to the dining room table, to the supper or to the dinner or to the banquet. That never happened. And third, it most certainly was never brought up by the queen. It was to Queen Esther an impossible request. Even to us, that seems so, so what? It was difficult to ask because this was such a rarity. But I want to remind you that the Jewish people was lying in the hands of Queen Esther. And so she had an impossible request. Have you been put in the time of the impossible? Has there been a time in your life that you said that it was impossible for this to happen? Just this week, and I think it happens every week all the time, but we don't have our eyes open. But just this week, I was eating with Alan and Janet at Crossroads in Keysport. And they introduced to me a grandpa by the name of Alan. And uh, some of you may know who he is. But here's the story. He was in the hospital a week or two ago. And they did an examination of his heart. And they said that it was 95% clogged and he has a little flappy thing around his heart. Now, I did take a little bit of biology, but I have no idea what a flappy thing is. Studied the aorta, the ventricle, those things. Never did I ever hear of a flappy thing. He said... The doctor came in and basically said that his life was hopeless. He might as well prepare to die. Because it was going to take at least two hours, maybe three hours, to actually get surgery, and then they'll just have to cross their fingers and hope. Complete hopelessness. Impossibility, right? He said, this is what happened. The next day I woke up and they took me down to the x-rays. And they did an x-ray on my heart, and they thought they had a different person. Because his heart was no longer 95% clogged. And there was no flappy thing. Who healed him? Church? Who healed him? Thank you. <laughs> I most certainly would hope that you said, God, God healed him. And that ought to excite us. But you know what has happened in a lot of our lives? So what? Man, that ought to get us excited. That ought to make us want to shout. God is still in the healing business. And he wants to heal you and me. And he invites us to come to the throne room. But Queen Esther experienced an impossibility in her life. And God was the one who opened the door for this to happen. A banquet, a simple request of a banquet. I want to give you the three people that's here. First of all, the king who stood there. It would be really easy for him to grant her request, and he did. Sure, have a banquet. Sounds good to me. The impossibility of Queen Esther, which is where we're at. Queen Esther, and I don't know if God would answer this or not, but I'm going to present it to him anyway. <laughs> There's one other person. One other person that's included... In this story and his name is Haman and I call him the deserving request you see the problem was he ran with it let me give you an idea and I'll express this more next week <laughs> a banquet for me well of course who wouldn't want to have a banquet for me 
I'm great. I'm going to get rid of these Jews. I'm doing fantastic. And here even the queen acknowledges it. How wonderful that they would invite me to come to have a banquet. Of course they would. Isn't that fantastic? The king and I can now go get drunk and we'll have a great time at the banquet that Queen Esther wants to honor me with. That's the third one. For which I caution you, there are times that we can be in too. Remember the old, original animation of Walt Disney? Remember Snow White? The old woman comes to the cottage of Snow White with what? An apple. And she offers the apple to Snow White and says, would you please eat and take this beautiful apple? And it is beautiful. And Snow White, not suspicious of anything, takes the apple, doesn't she? And she eats the apple, which she now realizes is not simply a beautiful apple, but is poison. And it puts Snow White into a deep, deep sleep. Welcome, sin. Satan presents to us, like that old woman, sin. And it's beautiful. Anybody that tells you that sin is ugly is not telling you the truth. It's beautiful. It's dressed up wonderfully. And Satan offers it to us and says, will you take the sin? And we go, well, yeah, I've been wanting that sin for a long time. I'll take that sin. But what we realize is whenever we bite into that sin, what happens is we fall into a deep sleep called death, spiritual death. And only the king can give the kiss that wakes up the bride of Christ. We can enter into the throne room, but what we need to do is be clean. We need to be holy. We need to do better than what we have done. The king will offer us the invitation. But we can't go and act like we have pride in our lives or have pride in our lives. For you see, pride comes before a fall. But the first thing that we need to do is to know the king. Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart He's raised from the dead, you will be saved. And that's how you enter into the royal family. The Lord offers that to you just as you are, even though He doesn't want you to remain where you are. Will you join the royal family? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that as I have presented this sermon, Lord, and I pray that you have taken the words and applied it to hearts, applied it to, to ones who, who need it. Lord, I pray that we have open hearts and pure hearts to accept what you have said. In Jesus' name, amen.